Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, this is where we left off last class. And can you all remind me, did we even did we have any time to like work on this? Maybe a little? Okay. So let's just let's take some time. All right. You are given formulas, and what I'm asking you to do is to write the name. And if you're feeling at all rusty on this, what I would suggest is go through and decide for each compound, is it ionic or is it covalent, okay? Um, just so you remember which naming system to use, okay? So let's just take some time to do this, and if you have printed out the slides already, um, if you finish this, then you can feel free to go on to the next slide to think about for the ionic ones that you come across. Anytime you come across an ionic, make sure you ask yourself, does this name, does this metal need a Roman numeral or not? Because some do and some don't. So, yeah, good question. So technically, you know, aluminum or metals that need a Roman numeral are mostly your transition metals and some of your metals underneath the staircase. And you're right, aluminum is technically under the staircase. There are some metals in, those, in that broad category that don't need a Roman numeral because they can carry only one charge. And that's just kind of something you need to know. Aluminum can only carry a charge of plus three. There are two other metals that you'll encounter frequently that also do not need a Roman numeral. Zinc is one. Zinc always has a plus two charge. Okay, so zinc doesn't need a Roman numeral. Another one that you're gonna encounter a lot is silver. Silver can only carry a plus one charge. Okay, and Zinc, you'll have to come up with a way to remember it. The silver one, it's sort of dumb, but AG, those are my initials. And obviously I'm number one, so <laughs> yeah, no big deal. All right, so now we'll go the other way. Okay, I'm giving you names, you write the formula. Again, if you're feeling rusty, Maybe it's helpful to decide what's ionic and what's covalent before you start. And I want to point out one in particular, because I got this question yesterday. This one right here. Okay. Look at the formula for that. Why is this not named nitrite? Why is the name of this nitrogen dioxide? Yeah. Correct. It doesn't have a charge, all right? This is a neutral compound. This is not nitrite. This is nitrogen dioxide, okay? If it had a charge of negative one, then it would be nitrite. So that's ionics, covalence. There is another set that we need to look at, and that is acidic compounds, okay? Now, first of all, let's make sure that we all understand what an acid is by definition. Okay, An acid is something that when it's put in an aqueous environment, remember that just means dissolved in water, it will release hydrogen ions. Okay. That is the definition of an acid. How do you recognize an acid? All right. Obviously, as I just said, acids have to have hydrogen in it. And to be more specific, most of the acids you're going to encounter, their formulas will have the hydrogen right at the beginning of the formula. Okay, so you'll be able to recognize them that way. And there's two types of acids out there. Oxy acids, and guys, that, that name means exactly what you think it does. It's an acid that contains oxygen. If you look at our polyatomic ion sheet, you'll notice that most of the polyatomics on there contain oxygen. So most of the time, this is going to mean hydrogen joined to one of our polyatomics. Okay. 
If it doesn't contain oxygen, we call it a binary acid. Okay, binary just means two things, hydrogen and something else, but that something else can't contain oxygen. Okay, they have their own naming system. Let's start with oxy acids. Okay, now here's the deal. When I gave you that polyatomic ion sheet, I cannot stress enough, and I tried to make this clear last class, you have got to know the name, formula, charge of those ones that we highlighted. You need to know those backwards and forwards. Okay, if you don't know all of that, that's going to make naming acids in particular very challenging. Okay, so here's the rule. All right, if you are looking at an acid and it's joined to a polyatomic ion whose name ends in eight, chlorate, sulfate, phosphate, you change the ending to ic, all right? Chloric, nitric acid. If it's hydrogen joined to a polyatomic ion that ends in ite, nitrite, phosphite, sulfite, it gets this OUS ending, okay? And years ago, my students came up with this little way to remember this, it's kind of dumb, okay? But you won't forget it, all right? If you ate something gross, it makes you feel sick. If you get in a fight, you need us. Okay, it's dumb, yeah, I get it, all right? But it's just a little memory trick. Okay. Um, one thing to just kind of watch out for, you know, if you're dealing with hydrogen joined to, let's say, sulfate, it's not sulfic acid, all right? It's sulfuric. And if it's sulfite, you don't say sulfous acid. It would be sulfurous, all right? Same thing with phosphate. It's not phosphic acid. It would be phosphate acid. All right, so let's just do these together real quick. Okay, so let's say you're taking a test. You come across this formula. Your job is to name it. You immediately recognize that it's an acid. Okay, forget the number two for the moment. That's not going to affect the name. Right. It's definitely an oxy acid. Can you guys tell me, please, what is the name of that polyatomic ion? Chromate. Chromate. Okay, so what does that become? Chromic acid, yeah. Chromic acid. All right, next one. Tell me, please, what is the name of that polyatomic ion? Perchlorate, okay, so perchloric, yeah. All right, last one. What's the name of this guy right here? Nitrite, so nitrous. Nitrous acid. Okay. That's, that's review from Chem 1, but I just wanted you to remember that. Okay, so if it's not an oxy acid, then it must be a binary acid, right? No oxygen. And if you guys will notice, on the previous slide, nowhere did we use the prefix hydro when we were naming these acids. You use that prefix only if you're talking about a binary acid, okay? And the nice thing about binary acids, they always end with ic, right? So let's just do some examples here, all right? Again, let's kind of model the thought process, all right? You're taking a test, you see this formula, you have to name it. You recognize that it's an acid, you don't see oxygen, so you say to yourself, okay, that's a binary acid. Can you guys tell me how you would name this guy? Okay, absolutely. Hydro, because it's binary. 
hydrochloric acid. All right, this one, again, that number, that subscript is not gonna affect the name. What do you think here? Be careful with this one. Okay, hydro, hydro what? Sulfuric. Good, sulfuric, don't say sulfic. This one is a little different. All right, so do you all see oxygen in there? No, me neither. All right, so it's not an oxy acid. Now what might be throwing you off is it's not just one single element. This is not one I had you highlight, but what polyatomic ion is that? Cyanide. Cyanide. Anybody want to take a guess with this one? Yeah, Kevin, what do you think? There you go, hydrocyanic acid, yeah. It's treated as a binary acid, so we use those rules. Okay. And it's treated as a binary acid because it does not have oxygen. Right? So, you would need to go the other way as well, given the name and you write the formula. And I want to do one of these with you. All right, we're going to actually, we're going to do this one right here. Okay. I'm going to model that thought process for you. Okay, so you come across the name, you're supposed to write the formula. First thing that jumps out to me is that word acid, which means it must begin with what? H. Very good. And tell me please, what is the charge of hydrogen in a compound? Plus one, yeah. Okay. All right, look at the first word. I don't see the prefix hydro. What does that mean to you? Okay, it's an oxy acid. Then you think, okay, what are the rules for oxy acids? That's that eight ick, I, us thing. What polyatomic ion is this telling us? Carbonate, okay? And if you don't have it memorized, you can look on your polyatomic ion sheet. What's the prefix for carbonate? I'm sorry, not the prefix. What is the charge of carbonate? Minus two. Minus two. Okay. So you say, okay, these charges do not add up to be neutral to zero. You do what I call the swap and drop. And so final answer. There you go. You guys do the rest. So it's an oxy acid. Ick tells me it came from something that ended with eight. One of the ones I asked you to memorize was dichromate. Okay, this di right here, guys, has don't think of it as like part of a covalent naming system. The polyatomic ion dichromate is Cr2O7 you look on your polyatomic ion sheet and it carries a charge of negative two. So it's H2 and then dichromate. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so let's start chapter three, guys. You will definitely need your periodic table and you will definitely need a calculator. Okay, because this chapter is stoichiometry. Okay, this is sort of the, the basics of the math of chemistry, all right? And the first thing I wanna say is, is about the word stoichiometry, because it gets used incorrectly a lot. A lot of people think that anytime you're doing any kind of conversion, like pounds to grams, anytime you're using dimensional analysis, I hear people say, oh, just, just do stoichiometry. Well. Any conversion is not stoichiometry. This word involves doing a conversion, but in, within the confines of a chemical reaction. If you don't have a chemical reaction, you're not doing stoichiometry, okay? This is the kind of situation where we see like, I have 50 grams of reactant, how many grams of product will I get? 
that's stoichiometry. Okay? And the first thing that I'm going to just remind you of, okay, on your periodic table, whatever element you look at, okay, we all know that the big number in the box is your atomic number, number of protons. The number with all the decimals, that's your atomic mass. Okay. Now just to be clear, because I want you to understand the, the difference here. The numbers in those boxes, atomic mass, that is the mass of one single atom of that element, and it's in units of AMUs. Right? The mass of one single atom of that element. And as for, um, you know, how you should round those numbers, guys, I am fine with you rounding those numbers. Whenever you need them in your calculations, you are permitted to round to one decimal place. That'll work. If you want to be more precise and take it to all of the decimals, then fine. All right. Now, you learned this in Chem 1, but I just want to refresh your memory on this, of why those atomic masses have all of those decimals, why they are not whole numbers. And we're going to use copper as our example here. Right? Copper has two isotopes out in nature. Okay, now let's just review that term. Here they are. Okay, do you guys remember, I think we did this last class, what does the number on the top represent? What do we call that? If the one on the bottom is the atomic number, what's the one on the top? Everybody. Mass, Mass number, which is the number of what? Protons, Protons plus neutrons. Okay, so if these are both copper, which means they have, the same, they have to have the same number of protons, what's the difference between them? Yeah, this one has two more neutrons. What these percentages are saying is if you went out in nature and gathered up every single copper atom on Earth, okay, which I realize is impossible, but you get a large enough sample, you would see that approximately 69.1% of that sample would be of this isotope and 30.9% would be of the other. The number that you see on your periodic table is this. It is a weighted average of all the isotopes on Earth. Okay? It's kind of like how your grade in any class is a weighted average of all the different categories of grades. I want you to look at this information. Why is the average atomic mass why is it closer to the number 63 than 65? Yeah, there's a greater, we use the word abundance, there's a higher percent abundance of that isotope. So the average should be closer to 63. Okay. I just wanted you guys to make sure you understand where this number comes from. But here's the deal. Guys, we're never going to be working in units of AMUs. We're not going to do problems where we're dealing with a single atom of some element. We are going to be working with multiple moles of elements. So we are not going to use atomic mass. We're going to be using what's called molar mass. And I want to make sure you understand the distinction. All right, let's use magnesium as an example. One single atom of magnesium has a mass of 24.3 AMUs. However, the mass of not just one atom, but a mole of magnesium atoms, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, would have a mass of 24.3 Rams. Okay, so you're gonna see me and you guys too, right? The numbers that you pull off your periodic table are gonna be in units of grams per mole, not AMUs. Okay, 
and you may round to one decimal place, as I said, okay? Just remember, molar mass, you gotta take the subscripts into account. Nitrogen has a molar mass of 14, two of them, it's 28. So, let's start getting into some calculations here. Percent composition, or more likely, it's called percent by mass. If, for example, I asked you to calculate in, within this compound what mass percentage is made up of iron, this is what you would do. Now, a percentage of, you know, like any other percentage, percentages are always part divided by whole times 100. Can you all tell me, please, find iron on your periodic table. Please tell me what is the molar mass of iron? What's the number? 55.85. How come that's not what this says up top? Yeah, there's two of them. Don't forget, you gotta take those subscripts into account. There's two of them over the molar mass of the whole thing, okay? And if this compound is 70% iron, what is the percentage of oxygen? 30%, okay. So this is really, really quick. All right, here's the compound you're dealing with. That's methane, that's the gas that comes out of our, the jets on the tabletops. What percent of methane is made up of hydrogen? Go. Very quick. Okay, methane is 25% hydrogen, which means it's what percent carbon? 75%, absolutely. Okay. Now, when you start getting into compounds that have more than two elements, you can't just do that quick subtraction because there's not just two elements. Okay. All right. Now, in all honesty, guys, am I going to have you calculating mass percentages? Not really, because that's too easy. Okay, for this class. All right. What are we going to use percent masses for? Okay, there's other things, but a lot of the time, percent by mass will be used to calculate either an empirical or a molecular formula. All right. You did this in Chem 1, so this should be review. All right, let's, let's define these terms. Okay, molecular formula means essentially how the compound exists in nature, All right? C6H6, one of my very favorite molecules, it looks like this. My drawing skills are not great. I wonder, does anybody know the name of that? Compound. This is not something I would expect you to know at this point. I just wonder if anybody knows what it is. It's called benzene. Okay. It has a very strong odor to it. Okay. But the point I'm trying to make is this is how it exists in nature. C6H6. If you reduce those subscripts down as much as you possibly can, then you get an empirical formula. If you're wondering, you know, what's, what's the purpose of having, knowing an empirical formula if C6H6 is how it exists in nature, why would you ever care about an empirical formula? Well, when you're doing calculations and you don't know what the molecular formula is, you're supposed to come up with that, you have to find this first, okay? So its purpose is really to get us to the molecular. All right, and I'm going to refresh your memory on how to do that. Okay, 
please don't write this down. Okay, these are the steps for how to do an empirical formula determination problem. Let's jump right to a, an example problem and you'll see that we actually do go through these steps. So here we go. This problem says, one of the most commonly used white pigments in paint is a compound of titanium and oxygen that contains 59.9% titanium by mass. Let's stop there. Can you do a little mental math? What's the percentage of oxygen? 40.1. Okay, that's probably going to come in handy a little later on. Then it says determine the empirical formula. Fine. Okay. Well, step number one is we're going to deal with these percentages. Okay, let me get to a new page here. All right, so the first step is I'm going to take those percentages and I'm going to take the percent sign off and put units of grams on. The thought being, if you had 100 grams of the whole compound, 59.9 of those grams would be titanium. Okay, we'll do the same thing for the oxygen. Step two is a very quick one-step conversion to get it from grams of the element into moles of the element. All right? Grams of titanium, one mole of titanium. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, where am I looking for that number? How do, where do I get it? Periodic table. Periodic table. Okay? You tell me. What's the molar mass of titanium? Thank you. 47.9. Let's do the same thing for oxygen. And please be careful here, okay, because I had some people yesterday asking, well, isn't oxygen, you know, one of our diatomic elements, isn't it O2? I mean, yes it is, but in this case, guys, oxygen is within a compound. It is not by itself. So I am not looking at O2, I am looking at just O. So this should be 16. Okay, now, I put in my calculator and I get this. Step two, done. Step three, we look at our number of moles and we're going to decide which one is the smaller number. That would be this guy. Okay. We are trying to get, the objective here is to get to whole number ratios of these elements. So the easiest way to do that is to divide both of your number of moles by that smaller number. And I get one there, and it might not be exact, but it's basically the number two there. Please tell me, what do these numbers become? What do I use them for? Yeah, the subscripts. Can these subscripts be reduced down anymore? Nope. There's my answer. That's my empirical formula. Now, will the ratios always be so nice? Will they always come out to be whole numbers? No, they won't. Okay. For example, and I know I realize the numbers don't show this, but just play pretend with me. Let's say we do, do this division step and I get one on the top, but I don't get the number two here, I get 2.5. Well, I can't put 2.5 as a subscript. Can't do that. How would you fix that problem? Yeah, Kevin. Multiply both numbers by two. 
You got it. Remember, the objective is to get to whole numbers. He says multiply both of the numbers there by the number 2. So that would lead me to have TI205. What if your numbers here were the number 1 and 2.333? What would you do? Multiply them both by 3. What if you had the number 1 here and the number 2.666? What are you going to do? Come on, math people. How about 3? That'll work. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Let's say you're doing a question like this in your homework or on a test, and you get the number 1 and 2.6. 8, 2. Okay, well, I don't really know what to do with that. That is a red flag, okay, that maybe something is amiss in your math. And let me tell you what the number one reason that people get these empirical problems incorrect. Here is the reason. When you solve for number of moles, as I have shown you here, please, please, please do not over round these numbers. You'll notice I have carried three decimal places. That is the minimum that you should carry. When you solve for number of moles, please keep at least three decimal places. Let me show you why. Let's say I had rounded these numbers to just one decimal place. This would still be 2.5, which is pretty much what this is anyway. This would round to 1.3. If I then looked at what ratio that is, I'm not going to get 1 to 2, and that's going to be a wrong answer. Okay, so write that down. Keep at least three decimal places. If you do that, you're much more likely to be able to automatically tell what these numbers are supposed to be. Okay, now, as I said before, what's the purpose of ever finding an empirical? It's the step you need to get to the molecular formula. And ladies and gentlemen, the biggest thing on this slide that you should take home here in order to get from the empirical to the molecular, you must be given the molar mass. Okay? You can't get from one to the other without knowing that. So, here's what I would like for you to do. We're given a problem here, very similar to the last one, a little bit different though in that not only are you supposed to find the empirical, you're also supposed to find the molecular. What I would like you to do is to use the data in this problem to find the empirical and then stop there. Unless you remember how to go on. All right, let me just call your attention to one thing and then I'm gonna let you do it on your own. Please notice you are not given percentages. And that's okay. That just means you don't have to take the percent sign off and put the grams, units of grams on. These are already in grams. Everything else is the same. So find them empirical and stop there. Okay. And remember, you can always check, you know, can I reduce these down anymore? No. You can be assured that you're empirical. But that's not the end of the problem. They ask us also to find the molecular. And as I said, you need the molar mass and they give it to us. Can you all tell me please, do a little quick addition here, what is the molar mass of one nitrogen, two oxygens put together? What do you get? 46. Okay, 46. For those of you that have the slides, I'm not going to scroll back up, 
Does that match the molar mass that they gave us? No, it doesn't. They told us the molar mass was 92. Without a calculator, can you all see the relationship here? Okay. And even if you can't, take the bigger number and divide it by this, you should get a whole number ratio. In this case, what is this? This number is two times double of this one. So you're going to double your subscripts as well. And that is your molecular formula. Okay, now, here's the bad news. Sorry. I'm not going to give you problems like this. This is too easy. Okay? Let me show you something that's a little bit more your speed. All right? I had to do these because I wanted to remind you of the foundations, but that's too easy. Here's what you're going to do. All right, so let's, let's tackle this problem. It says, a compound contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, right off the bat, this is a little different because it doesn't have two elements. It has three that we have to deal with. Combustion of a certain amount of the compound yields a certain amount of CO2 and a certain amount of water. Okay. Before I go any further, I'm just going to write out the information that I was just given there. All right? Here is the compound we're dealing with. And I don't know what the subscripts are. So I'm going to use variables. Can you all tell me, please, what does combustion mean chemically. What does that mean? Everybody. Adding oxygen. Thank you. <laughs> Adding oxygen. All right. How do you write oxygen when it's by itself? O2. Thank you. Yields CO2 and water. And then I'm going to go in and sort of fill in the amounts here. I was given 10.68 grams of this, 16.01 grams of that, 4.37 grams of that. Okay. They give us some molar mass information, which is good because I'm not only calculating empirical, I need molecular as well. Here is the thought process, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at the two problems we just did, what is it that you ultimately need to solve for in order to get those ratios? What unit do you need to be in to finally figure out what those ratios are? Moles, okay? Your goal here is for each of these elements, you need to figure out how many moles of each one there are. Moles of C, moles of H, moles of O. Okay? Look at the information we have been given. All right? Can, I'm, you know, don't be afraid to be wrong. Okay, let's just throw out some ideas here. And there's more than one way to do this, by the way. How could I figure out how much, let's start with carbon, how much carbon, just carbon alone, is in that compound? How could I get to units of just carbon, being given what I am? You didn't even say this, but I know this is what you understand. All of the carbon that is here, where does it end up? Right there. And he, what he said was, we could use that percent by mass to deal with this. Find what is the percent of carbon within this compound and then multiply it times that number. That will absolutely work. There is another way, but you could just start with 16.01 grams of CO2 and convert it down to moles of C. Now that is something 
you may or may not have done in Chem 1. If you were in honors, you probably did. If you took regular, you may not have. All right, but I'm going to show you, in case you don't know how to do that, how, how to do that. So I want to get out of CO2, because I don't want that. Tell me, please, what is the molar mass of CO2? 44. OK. And guys, if I stopped right there, I mean, we said we need to be in moles. That would be moles of CO2. And that is not what I want. I want moles of just carbon. Okay, so this next step is something some of you will have done and some of you will not have done. Okay, I can do that. And here's the thought process. One mole of the whole compound contains how many carbons? What, what are you going to say there? Yeah, just one. What if I was going one mole of CO2 into moles of just O? What would you put there? Two. Two. Okay, very good. All right, I'll save you the time. This is what you end up getting. Okay. And let me just say again, what Kevin said about using the percent by composition, that will work. You can use that method as well. That would give you grams of just C. You just have to go one additional step to get to moles of C. All right. So one third of the way there. Let me go back to the slide here. Okay. Next step, we need moles of H, just H. What, do, what should I do here? How am I going to do that? Yeah, same method. Okay, we can use the percentage method if you prefer that, or we can just start straight from here and find moles of H. We can do that. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. two-thirds of the way there. Again, keep reminding yourself, what is it that I really need here? I need moles of each element. I've got moles of C, I've got moles of H, okay. moles of O. Let me come back to our original slide. This is the tricky part. Right. And I want you to throw out ideas. Please don't afraid, be afraid to be wrong. Okay? There is more than one way to figure this out, but I want you guys to figure it out. I don't want to tell you. What's the problem? Like, why does, what is it that's making finding moles of O a little tricky? Yeah, Haley. There's no CO2. Right. Oxygen is in both of our products. And that's a little tricky. So give me some ideas. What what could we do? We need to get down to just O. Yeah, throw out an idea. Okay. So what she said is get down to moles of O for each one of those compounds and then add them together. All right, good thought. And I bet a lot of you were thinking that too. I'll tell you that that's not gonna work and I really want, want you to understand why that's not gonna work. Okay, if I were to do that, that would give me the total amount of oxygen on the product side, absolutely. The problem is, I want just how much oxygen was right here. 
I don't care about this. Okay. The total oxygen on this side, that mass, would include some of this. And I don't care about that. I only want to know how much oxygen is there. Okay, so that's not going to work. So let's think of some other ways to do this. Yes. There we go. Correct. Okay. Let's go back to what we've already calculated. What he said was, what if I change this back to grams? This number of moles is how many grams of C? This is how many grams of H? Think about that, all right? We had, let me put it up on the board. I can find my marker. We had 10.68 grams of the whole compound. If I subtract, grams of C and I subtract grams of H, what am I left with? Grams of O. Okay, now let's again, let's just kind of take stock of what is it that we ultimately need here? Moles of each element. Can I turn, can I get to moles of O from here? Yeah, I can. Okay. Let's do that. Now, I'm not going to write this up here because it's just subtraction. But let's take that 10.68 grams, subtract the mass of the carbon, subtract the mass of the hydrogen, and that leaves me with this. Can I get this into moles? Nod your heads. Yes. Okay. We're almost done with this problem. You've done the hard part. All right. I'm going to draw arrows of a different color next to the numbers that we care about. What's, this, what's the next step? What am I going to do with those numbers? Okay, find the whole, the, the whole number ratio, and what's the quickest way to do that? Divide them all by the smallest. Okay, so that would be this. They're actually, carbon and oxygen are actually the same number. What do you do with that situation? Multiply them all by three, and let me write it again in a different color. Down at the bottom, that's going to leave us with right here. Can those subscripts be reduced down anymore? Nope. That is our empirical formula. There's just one more step, I swear. Okay. I know you were hoping the problem would keep going. I was too. We got your wish. You got one more step to go. All right. That is our empirical. They want the molecular as well. Can you guys do some quick addition here and tell me what is the molar mass of that compound? 88? Okay. 88 grams per mole. I'm running out of room. Does that match the molar mass they told us in the problem? 
The mass in the problem, they said, was 176. Okay. How does 88 compare to 176? Times 2? Okay, so your molecular formula, you would multiply these all times 2, C6H8O6. And guys, let me just say, we've done two examples where from empirical to molecular, it was double the molar mass. It doesn't have to be double, okay? It could be triple, it could be quadruple. It will be some whole number multiple. That is the end of that problem. Welcome to AP Chem, okay? <laughs>